All right, this is an interview at Lions Hall, Canisius College, Buffalo, New York. It is the 6th of May, 2008, approximately 3.45 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, my name is Sebastian Fasanella. Uh, date of birth, uh, November 9, 1935. Place of birth is Buffalo, New York. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Prior to entering service, I had completed uh, a year of internship uh, in, uh, in general medicine and also completed a year of internal medicine residency uh, at the University of Buffalo. So I had already received my MP. I was at two years into my advanced training. Okay. Um, did you, were you enlisted or, excuse me? No, I, I, I wasn't in, you know, in the, um, the ROTC program. Oh, okay. At Canisius College, and uh, I then somehow ended up in, in the, what was called the Berry program at the time, uh, which allowed you to uh, defer your your army time, um, actually as much as you can, hopefully to get in some extra training. And mm -hmm. I, I did. I got an extra year in, and then I was I was called up in uh, in uh, July of uh, 1964. Okay. Um, now you went in as an officer. Then. Yes. Yes. Uh, Lieutenant? Uh, captain. Oh, you went in as a captain because of your... Because of that because MD. Right. All right. Um, could you tell us where you went when you went into the service? Oh, sure. Uh, initially, uh, I can give us some background. I, I, was, I was in training at, at the old Meyer Hospital. My wife was pregnant with our fourth child, and I was informed that I was you know, to enter July 1st. And instead of going to Fort Devens, which is where my post was, I went up to what is now, what's called, I don't think it's called Camp Drum anymore. Fort it's Drum. Fort, Fort Drum. It's now Fort Drum. At that time, that was a place where uh, all of the reservists went for their summer training. Mm -hmm. And there were probably, I mean, literally tens of thousands of, of guys there during the summer. So they needed extra docks up there. So I was sent up there for the summer. Um, and uh, my wife delivered while I was up there, so I ran home over the weekend. And the, uh, the colonel who was in charge of the hospital said, if I didn't send you home, I would never be able to stand all the phone calls from your wife. <laughs> so, so he sent me home. Um, I stayed there until October uh, because the camp commander was a rather lonely guy and said that uh, i really like to have a doc around. There were, there were probably 15 people on base. So I hung out. I mean, there was nothing to do at Camp Drum, literally nothing. Now you could be a very busy guy mm -hmm. and do some good. I did nothing for a long time. And in fact, there were four or five other officers with me who literally, we sat around and read books all day. Um, and know that's not a, a great a commentary on, on my time in the service, but that's what we did. And it was very disappointing. Uh, I finally got back to Fort Devens uh, and uh, was the uh, director of the Infectious Disease Unit at Fort Devens. And that was a great time. So a lot in of, what ways? What made it? There was a, there were a lot of interesting cases. We you know we, we not only treated uh, obviously the GIs but uh, families. Uh, we treated all the dependents. So um, I, I had an adult unit, and I I saw some some cases that I hadn't even seen before. I saw um, my first and only case of trichinosis, mm -hmm. uh, which is which was really interesting, uh, and um, saw some other interesting things. We also would rotate through the emergency room every third night, so we got to see uh, children, um, young adults. Um, we had to see a lot of things, so it was it was a very interesting time. Um, one of my colleagues was sent to the that was the time when Alaska had an uh, enormous um, they have an earthquake, and one of my colleagues was was sent to Alaska, and I remember uh, talking about his experiences, and that became int interesting later on when I was sent to the Dominican Republic because he had, they had somehow accumulated a lot of winter clothing. Um, and I was sent to the Dominican Republic. I opened up my knapsack, or whatever that thing was, my duffel bag, and in there was uh, winter clothing <laughs> instead of tropical clothing. But we'll get into that later on. <laughs> so, uh, Fort Evans was a very nice place. Uh, did, a, did a lot of good work there. Uh, I was very happy there. Uh, met a lot of good friends. In fact, we still have some friends who we still travel with, who we met at Fort Devons. Uh, How long were you at Devons? I was at Devons, all told, I was probably there about uh, eight months out of the two years. My wife and children were there for the full two years. 
and uh, met some. I have to say, the Army experience for us, um, when you get on base and you're from out of town, it's just everybody is just willing to help. Uh, we have more people willing to give us help with the kids, uh, show us where to shop, uh, do all. And then when I when I left Fort Devens to go to the Dominican Republic, um, my wife had no difficulty at all. I mean, people would come over, uh, they'd take her shopping, they would help with the kids, they would all kinds of things. They were just amazing. And one of those friends uh, we've, we've been in touch with for a long time. In fact, I've traveled literally to some, maybe four or five places in the world with them because they were such good friends. Um, so that was Fort Devens. Uh, in May of 65, um, you probably don't remember this, but the Dominican Republic was a revolution. And uh, we started out by sending a few Marines down there in late May. Uh, and by, uh, I'm sorry, late April. And by May 1st, they had decided that uh, this was a much bigger thing than they expected. So they decided that the 82nd Airborne would go down. Unbeknownst to me, I was attached to the 82nd Airborne Division uh, to a field hospital. I was going to ask you, did you, you never did jump training or? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> no. In fact, we, we were going on, on vacation. I had the car packed, uh, and we were coming home for because I had a week's leave. The car packed, the dog was in the kennel. I went back to the hospital to check something. I forgot what it was, and I hear my name page to one of the most silly things I ever did was to answer that page because I got called into the colonel's office who said, uh, you're leaving tomorrow morning. I said, for where? I'm going on vacation. He says, you're not going anywhere. I said, you're going, you're going to Fort Bragg. I said, my, you know, my kids are in the car, we're going. He says, so uh, the next morning I left for Fort Bragg. And I wasn't sure whether we were going to, uh, Vietnam was just beginning to heat up at the time. Um, people were suspicious that maybe that's where we were going. But it turned out that we were going to the Dominican Republic. So we stayed there for a day and uh, talk about confusion. It's kind of like nobody knew what was going on. Um, so we just kind of sat around and everybody postulated in terms of what was going to really happen. But all of a sudden we found ourselves on a C-130 uh, heading down to the Dominican Republic. Uh, that was interesting because as, as when we got on the plane, the pilot gave us this lecture about um, safety and all the rest of it and said, don't worry about the airplane. It says, these planes can fly on two engines that had four. So, so on the way down, of course, we lost an engine. <laughs> so, so we were all waiting for the second engine to go, but that never happened. Uh, and then we landed it, it, in the Dominican Republic in the middle of the night. And um, this, was my, this was my Hillary Clinton thing, because we actually did land and they were shooting. Uh, you got out of the plane, and there were these uh, tracers, I guess they called them. I mean, the sky was just lit up with all this mm -hmm. stuff, and you're all these bombs and stuff. And I thought, my God, you know, what is going on here? It was really, it was really a war. So we, we went to the place where we were supposed to be, our hospital was supposed to be. Of course, there wasn't a hospital. There was probably 10 or 15 tents, and it was a field hospital. And when I reported to the uh, commander of the hospital, he says, what are you doing here? I says, what am I doing here? I said, somebody sent me here from Boston. He says, you're not supposed to be here. Well, but I was there. And that happened to about the next 10 doctors that came in. Apparently, there was some confusion in terms of how many men they really needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we were there. Um, I think chaos would probably be the best word to describe the situation. It's kind of like, um, and I'm sure things are a lot better in today's army. And we. We, we set up the field hospital in a place that uh, at that time of the year was prone to flooding. And apparently they had been warned about this, but everybody insisted that they knew better. So we set up this field hospital. And I actually have pictures of, of guys, you know, walking to chow to get their sea rations, you know, in water like this high. You know, it, was, it was a disaster. Um, eventually we, we were able to get out of that situation and moved into the old uh, naval barracks of the Dominican uh, Navy, and that was a pretty nice, that was a pretty nice situation. Um, it was it was rather interesting now to me because I had never been in combat, I had never seen any war injuries, and all of a sudden you know you're seeing people with, you know, arms hurt, legs hurt, people died, 
uh, I think one of the most interesting things that I saw was I was I was covering. We used to cover nights uh, mm -hmm. because there wasn't a lot of activity at nights, and I, I went to the emergency room because I was called, and there's a young man there uh, with his helmet, and he was uh, cleaning his 45 pistol. Of course, accidentally went off, and he had a he had his, his steel helmet on. The bullet hit the rim of the helmet and split in two. Half of it went into his head, but fortunately, because it had hit the helmet, uh, it, it entered here and went up his scalp, didn't pierce his skull. So this, this, this is one of the luckiest guys in the world. I mean, he hit him right here. And uh, I'll never forget, I, I was fussing around and I, I said, I found it. <laughs> it's, it's right here. Made a little incision and popped out a half of a 45 shell which is, I think, one of the most amazing things I've ever done. And this guy was just, uh, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to die, you're not going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an interesting story. We had some, we had a lot of things like that. Now, yeah. how about your equipment? Did you have pretty uh, up-to-date equipment that was shipped I, I out think as up-to-date as you it? could have in those days. Mm -hmm. We were talking about 1965. Yes, right. Um, yeah, we had x-ray stuff and uh, nothing really fancy, but we were able to do uh, whatever we needed to do. I think. What we needed were, especially a few weeks later when, when they made this big push to drive out the rest of the rebels uh, in a certain section of the city, we needed a lot more surgeons. Uh, we didn't have enough surgeons. We didn't have a neurosurgeon. There were a lot of head injuries and stuff. Um, but as far as equipment, I, I think we were okay. Um, Did you have enough equipment, enough um, medical supplies? Yeah, there was, there was never a problem with mm -hmm. that. I think we had a problem with manpower. Because I think they, and again, you know, I don't know much about about their business, but I think they underestimated just how bad this was going to get. I mean, at one point they had 42,000 troops down there, uh, <clears throat> but not enough manpower to cover the days when um, there was probably a week when there was really intense fighting. And uh, there were a number of injuries and just not enough guys to take care of it. I mean, I'm not a surgeon, but I did minor surgical kinds of things. Um, when things settled down, it, was, it became fairly interesting because we ended up treating many civilians, uh, Dominican civilians. In fact, we were getting bored, so uh, several of us went to one of the local hospitals and offered our services. You know, you know what could we do to help? Mm -hmm. And that was great for about a week. And then several of the attending physicians at the hospital really got, kind of got angry because Americans were in the hospital and treating their patients. I mean, we really had no intention of stealing patients, mm -hmm. but they really became quite upset with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the commanding officer said, you know, what are you guys doing, blah, 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 and we had to stop doing that. Um, however... I was ask with you, your, your background, you had been with an infectious disease, you must have found some really yeah. interesting right. diseases. Um, that but I, I was basically uh, in internal medicine, knew a lot of uh, cardiology and pulmonary disease was up. In fact, um, since I was the only person there at that time with, with a year of internal medicine under my belt, um, I used to read all the ex they, they hired hundreds of people from the area uh, to work for the Army, mm -hmm. you know, washing or making, whatever they did, they needed a lot of people. And of course, many of these people had tuberculosis. Uh, so I was the guy who was reading all the x-rays, and all of a sudden I became an expert in, in tuberculosis, which I wasn't before I, I joined the service. Um, but that was interesting. It's interesting, the, the doctors didn't want us to go to the hospital, but we ended up seeing kind of like some of the elite of the Dominican uh, public. Uh, uh, I had like a small office in, in the Naval Academy there, and I would see some people periodically that come in with some interesting stuff. And in fact, I, have, I still have a flag that one of these women brought me, a Dominican flag that she had made uh, as kind of a gift. Uh, so some, somehow these people kind of got into the system. Um, what was really disturbing down there after things settled down was the, the poverty. Uh, when you finally got a chance to kind of you know, get a Jeep and, uh, or run in a helicopter mm -hmm. and see what was going on, the poverty was just unbelievable. Uh, they would they would take our in those days they called them sea rations. Um, they came in boxes about this thick, cardboard boxes. <clears throat> we would take the rations out, throw the boxes into a dump, kind of, and people would come pick up the boxes, and then they would you would be riding down the road and you'd see walls 
they, they would open the boxes up and put them against, to somehow put them against sticks or whatever they could, and they made walls for huts, which was, I mean, that's kind of an indication of just how poor things were. I think at the time, and I may be wrong historically, but maybe I think 20% of the population was working in, in some of the sugar sugarcane industry because apparently that was the mainstay of their, uh, their business. Um, and they would work like one or two days a week and somebody else would work one or two days a week so people would get enough money. It was really sad. There were, um, an, an interesting occurrence, when we first got there, I, was, um, I became really good friends with uh, three or four other physicians, all of whom were from the South. Uh, these guys were all hunters, okay? They all had guns at home, bows and arrows, all kinds of stuff. We get there and the, uh, somehow they wouldn't issue us uh, any weapons. They wouldn't issue us 45s because we were, we were physicians. Well, that was okay as long as you're stuck in base. But they would also send us out to these outposts to cover, like on a weekend, you'd go out someplace, they'd send you in a Jeep uh, with a driver, and they had a tent set up. They'd have some medical stuff there, and you were supposed to stay there in case there were, I'm not sure who was supposed to, I never saw anybody there, mm -hmm. but we stayed there all weekend, all by yourself in this tent. So these guys thought this is really kind of crazy. So um, they somehow had shipped from the States we had a shipment of five shotguns sent to the Dominican Republic. Believe it or not, I still have a shotgun at home. So we had our own weapons. So we would walk around with these shotguns, and nobody ever said anything because we had a shotgun. But if we had a 45, I guess I would have been against the rules. So we were trapped. We have, I have some great pictures of us with these, with these shotguns. We never fired one. But you, you travel in some places, and I mean, for the first, I'd say, maybe three or four months, there was a lot of, there was a lot of fighting down there. I mean, nothing like Iraq, nothing mm -hmm. like Vietnam. But I think there were like 20 people who died, 20 soldiers who died, I think there were like 200 injuries. Uh, so it was, it was kind of interesting. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting story. Um, another significant event was um, Tony Bennett came down to see us and brought, um, and I'm trying to think of a woman's name who was like, the, actually the epitome of dancing at that time. Ah. Anyway, Tony Bennett came to our hospital. And was it Julia Prouse, was it? No, not Julia Prouse. Uh, keep on thinking, maybe you'll hear <laughs> uh, When the song, I, I Left My Heart in San Francisco, mm -hmm. he played that song in our hospital the first time. And he, he came down with a, with a guitarist, uh, Tony, Tony somebody with a Matoa. And uh, he was singing on, on, uh, on the porch of our hospital to the troops who were injured. I mean, that was really <laughs> unbelievable. And then they had this enormous show at the airplane uh, base, uh, which they finally had gotten control over. And they had thousands of guys. And they had this girl dancing, and I'll never remember this. They had, they had MPs. There was a cordon of MPs around in front of the stage. And somehow, a number of these guys would jump over the MPs or push them around. They got up on the stage and started dancing, and it all hell broke loose. <laughs> because the MPs couldn't get them off the stage. They had to drag her off the stage. Because, I mean, they hadn't seen this kind of woman in a long time. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about the Dominican Republic? We stayed there. I was there until November. Uh, uh, 1965. Um, we had gone through several commanders. Our first commander was relieved, uh, I think, because he really wasn't too sharp. Second commander was a superb guy who um, he used to play basketball with us. And one hot afternoon, we're playing basketball, and he dies on the basketball court. Those are the days before we had defibrillators. Okay. And so here are five doctors who are trying to work on their commander, uh, and he ne we were never able to resuscitate him. That was a particularly bad incident, and, uh, and I'll just never forget that. I remember we, we wrote home to his wife and stuff. He was a terrific guy, and, uh, but he died on the basketball. He was only, I think he was like 55. If we had had the equipment that we have today, probably would be alive, but uh, we just didn't have anything like and in fact, I can remember when I, when I was in training before I went into the service, I think we had one defibrillator for the whole hospital at, uh, at ECMC, or at the Elmire Hospital. Um, other events, 
Yeah, that was about it in, in the Dominican Republic. Um, I learned a lot. I, I saw a lot. Um, I, I think I really appreciated just just how desperate uh, people uh, in, this, in the southern hemisphere are. And in fact, we went back to the Dominican Republic about three years ago. Uh, you know, as, as you know now, it's really a, a place to uh, to visit. Mm -hmm. We have all these gorgeous resorts, but you go to the resort. And you leave the resort and you go to some of the smaller mm -hmm. places, e even the road from the airport. I mean, you can still see. I mean, the level of poverty is just unbelievable. Um, so I, I came home in November. Um, we, um, and I guess from that point out, it was things were pretty quiet. I know, I, I hurt my knee and I had surgery, and that was that. <laughs> yeah, and we were, we were discharged in July of, of, of 66. Um, those were the years you had to put in for right. your... 64 to 66. Uh, time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> were you ever able to make use of a GI Bill at all at, because of your service? or? Um, not, not really. Mm -hmm. No, because I had actually finished my, yes. my formal training. Yeah, yeah, the rest of this was you know, uh, yeah. additional training, and uh, we were paid a salary. Meager as it was, we still got money. You know, uh, the GI Bill didn't really apply to to postgraduate training, yes, right. in, in medicine at least. Um, did you ever uh, join any veterans organizations at all? Never did. Didn't stay in the reserves. Mm -hmm. Although I guess for a couple of years after service, you're, uh, you're still in the reserves. I remember one of my southern friends uh, calling me up uh, some Sunday afternoon after about six months we were home and saying, did you get your notification? They're calling us back in <laughs> for Vietnam. And like, oh my God, <laughs> but this was a joke. Um, you said you stayed in contact with uh, some that served with you, mm -hmm. and um, how, how do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? Um, if it did. Number one, I think I think it gave me an appreciation for um, trying to make the best out of every day that you can because you just don't know what's going to be happening. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was a really important lesson. Uh, I really began to appreciate um, even more uh, what this country has and what this country has to offer and, and how lucky we are here. Um, I also, uh, I guess it's, those are probably the major things that mm -hmm. I, I had. So I had some really good experience from, from a medical point of view. Uh, I guess also, it also uh, one of the major things was when I went down there, I was going to be an internist. When I when I came back, I ended up going into psychiatry. So that obviously had an impact. Okay. How do you think your time, since we're doing this for Canisius, how do you think your time at Canisius had an effect on your, your education, your life? Well, uh, first of all, I, I think my time at Canisius was critical in terms of getting into medical school. Um, I, I remember, even at that time, um, people who, who had their undergraduate training in Canisius still did very well when it came to applying to medical school and being accepted. Um, I think I was well trained for medical school, and I, and I think just the, just kind of like the Jesuit philosophy and the training that we got here in terms of morality, ethics, et cetera, I think that stood me in good stead and still does. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. I think it was really good. Okay, well thank you very much for having me.